Normally this slot is the post-lunch carbohydrate coma, um, but given that morning is about now, I'm guessing it's post-breakfast carbohydrate coma for everybody. Uh, this is the message in the messenger delivering information 101. You're at DerbyCon, or in lieu of wool, as I've been told to say. Uh, disclaimer, I have a job. I'd like to keep my job. All of my opinions are my opinions. Mine and mine alone. I have coworkers in the audience. They're not going to tell my bosses anything at all. Also, it's all in your mind, but the man is trying to keep you down. Uh, <clears throat> I, I keep getting asked, as I'm doing a communications seminar, uh, why I should be allowed to talk to InfoSec people. And the reality is, I've done InfoSec a lot. Uh, probably too much. Uh, that 19 is ready to turn into 20. And that's kind of spooking me out a little bit. Uh, I work for Leviathan. Uh, we are hiring. If you need a job, please talk to me. Uh, I do analytical work for Securosis, which means I get paid to have an opinion. My wife says it's the perfect job. Uh, I've been staff. I've done everything from Firewall Monkey to CISO. Uh, I've been a consultant, I mean, consultant, uh, <clears throat> time and time again. Uh, and I'm not an expert at anything. And when you find someone who says they're an expert at something, they are lying out loud without bothering to warn you. This talk includes the fact that we're all special snowflakes. No, for real, we are. Each one of us. It's a freaking snowstorm in here. It's awesome. We're going to get from idea to delivery. And this is something that, as a class, all information security people absolutely suck at getting from idea to delivery. There is no box popping or exploiting. There will be no metasploit splooge all over the stage. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, we will not abuse each other. I am the butt of all jokes for today. Okay? The introduction, theoretically 20 minutes. Critical self-evaluation something we're very, very bad at. We're accustomed to other people evaluating us and having all kinds of opinions about how awesome or not awesome we are. This is time when we have to look inward and be a little bit truthful. It is going to hurt. I'm sorry. Uh, starting with self-abuse, because there's no InfoSec person who hasn't done a little bit of self-abuse. Uh, I studied this stuff in college, uh, which was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away when slide shows were made with slides, like the Kodachrome kind, like little pieces of plastic that had chemistry on them, and we put them in little carriers in slide projectors. And changing your slide deck had to happen two weeks in advance of your talk. Wouldn't that be nice if everybody was prepared two weeks before they go on stage? Yeah. Um, I've done an incredible amount of, of private speaking, and I started doing security talks, and you people keep showing up. It's kind of awesome. Our industry includes people who have some absolutely fabulous ideas, great research, incredible amount of effort into doing the basic stuff of getting our jobs done. Lots of those people can neither present nor write, and it's unfortunate because their ideas die alone. We might be missing out on the true genius because the individuals are incapable of getting it out to us. We have lots of people who can present, but can't write. Uh, working on multiple CFP committees, I can tell you there are lots of people who can present and are hopeless at writing it down. Vice versa is also true. There are some people who write incredibly brilliant full papers, blog posts, everything in between, stand them up in front of an audience. Bad things happen while they mumble to themselves about what's on their slide. There are a very small number of people who can both write and present. Those people end up being called the rock stars who show up at every conference, and it's sad. That being said, there are lots and lots of ways to screw up. Here's a few of my favorites. <laughs> so this, was, this talk was originally in the context of really, really bad CFP responses. So it includes things like not submitting at all, submitting incompletes, not written in a known language, that's a parser fail, and uh, <clears throat> not spoken in a known language, that's a buffer crap flow. I don't know why nobody uses buffer crap flow when they're talking about real computer security problems. It's a good word. Uh, and it just goes on from there. A lot of it comes down to incredible hubris, being so sure that you are so awesome 
that it doesn't matter that you do the actual step-by-step -step doing a good job. You get on stage and you shit rainbow gold infosec research, which is terrific if you can actually do that. Most people, they just leave a stinky pile in the corner. Um, <clears throat> my absolute favorite of this is uh, number 25, slides with too many words on them. <laughs> Anybody know Marshall McLuhan? Couple hands. Uh, scientist, philosopher, history will tell someday what role he truly spent. Uh, but the important part for all of us is that he was a thinker in the 60s about how media, society, and messaging interact. And he is most famously known for his catchphrase, the medium is the message. Awesome, thank you. I'm just going to plug this in right now because I'll need it later. Okay. The medium is the message. This is the least well understood of any declaration ever made by a scientist. Uh, you'll have people who bring their own versions of this to the table, and they're almost always wrong. People who studied McLuhan for a decade still don't necessarily get it right. So I'm going to try and condense it for you guys to help you understand why it's important. Everybody knows what a medium is? Everybody knows what a message is? These things collide in interesting ways, and the medium itself provides a message. He said, the form of a medium embeds itself in the message, creating a symbiotic relationship by which the medium influences how the message is perceived. In English, for those of you who don't speak university, what he's saying is the media choice infects the message and provides its own messaging material. So let's use an example, because examples are good. For a movie, he argues that movies play with your conception of time and space. How many people have watched a movie? They run 110, 140 minutes, unless it's The Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> the time that actually passes in the movie varies from something less than that to something quite significantly more. Time becomes rubbery. And for humans, time is rubbery. But this is an interesting kind of side effect. He said, by changing sequence and connection, the fact that it is a film lets you flow freely through time. The real message is, in most movies, time is the interesting part. How the story is told in sequence is the interesting part. He says that the content of any medium is always another medium, with one minor exception. So the content of writing is speech. Print is writing, and telegraph is print. You can carry all of those through. Each one containerizes the, the next. But each one provides a different viewpoint into what you should take from the message. Speech is fleeting. It's ephemeral. Writing is usually person to person or person to self. Print is for a wider audience or for permanence. And telegraph is, this message is important. It is timely. It doesn't matter what the content is. Each one of those is fleeting, person to person or person to self. Totally getting pwned by those guys. But you guys are actually learning, so it's all good. <laughs> Um, when it's printed, it's something that should be paid attention to. It's formalized. When it's a telegraph, time is of the essence. Stop. There's mediums that have social effects. Light bulbs are a medium. They have no actual content, but their message is we can push back the night. We can create a place that's safe. That's some seriously high-end shit, you know. One of the things that is very important is that we can't predict the effects of a medium on a culture until after it's been embedded. McLuhan lived in a time when television existed. 
okay. What's changed about television from then till now? The 24-hour-ness. I mean, when I was a kid, television ended every day and started every morning. Now, it's 24 hours, and it's a panic. The medium of the 24-hour news channel has created a message of, you must always be scared. There's always something happening, and it's always bad, and it's happening in your neighborhood right now. Ouch. It doesn't matter what the actual message is. That's the content that you're taking in. So our values and norms as a society change according to how the medium is perceived, how the medium message gets mixed up. Everybody nod and smile right now. In two or three days, you'll go, and it'll all be good. But you want to be a better presenter, right? That's why you're all here. That's why everybody's been reading the tweets that say other presenters at DerbyCon should have seen this talk first. There are rules we must follow about respect. Respect is something that is very fleeting in this uh, industry, and especially in these kinds of environments. We're going to have to make fun of each other. Uh, I will be the brunt of the jokes. You need to look the part. Whether your presentation is in an elevator with your boss's 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 boss, or whether it's in front of 3,000 people at DEF CON, you still need to look the part. And you've got to be prepared to be that guy. I, I'm a dad with a bunch of kids. I look like this all the time. But you have to realize that regardless of what your message is, your media becomes important. When you look at this picture of me, you cannot take me seriously. You can try really hard, but I've got birthday hats on my ears. Your body language is incredibly important. How many people telegraph their emotions through their body language? How many people are sitting in the audience right now like, I don't give a shit what he has to say, I'm still awesome. When you're on stage in front of people and you don't even care enough to stand up, you're telegraphing a certain amount of emotion that way. People who come from cultures that use lots of hand gestures as parts of communication for emoting and for pointing things out. Yeah, I grew up in a town that had an Italian vice consulate. All my friends talked with windmills. It's awesome. Uh, you'll see presidential candidates pointing at you without pointing. Because finger guns are only awesome when you're nine. Pew, pew. Waving your hands and arms around is entertaining when you're trying to be an entertainer. At this point, I was in the middle of a Hacker Pyramid game show, and of course I had to be funny. But most of the time, it's distracting. You know, especially if you're doing things like the bad point, or the I'm holding a volleyball. These are standard moves. Eh? Presentation experts will tell you, if you don't know what to do with your hands, hold a volleyball. This is good because at least you're not touching your face or your junk. Your expression matters. I've discovered through watching hours and hours of video of myself, I apparently do not have top teeth. For the record. <laughs> your natural expression, in almost every case, is pissed off and or angry and or bored. Most people, it's pissed off to super pissed. You can affect these things. You know, you can take charge of your face. Remember I said don't touch your face? You can still use the muscles that are in your face. You don't have to put a smile on, you can just have a smile. And it's interesting how much all these things collide together. Because it turns out that if you're not telegraphing your body language, telegraphing your emotions, if you're standing up straight, push your shoulders back, yes, there's a certain amount of, ha ha, look at me, but you increase your lung volume and you can speak more loudly. You can be heard and understood at the back of the room even if there's no microphone. This room is just barely big enough to need a microphone. You should be able to talk that loud. You shouldn't mumble to yourself. You shouldn't ever look down. It's just you're compressing things. And we all slouch for a living, right? We all have monitor tan. It's getting better now, though, because the LEDs put out less actual harmful radiation than the um, electron guns we used to point at our faces. But we slouch. Curl those shoulders in, push that lung volume down, 
you're not getting good air, you're mumbling yourself. You could hear this on every webcast you've ever listened in on because the people who are delivering it are sitting at their desk and they're slouched over, they're compressing their lung volume and they're telegraphing through their voice a lack of interest or a lack of concern for being in the room. Calculate the cost of having all of you in this room in terms of lost dollars. It's a big number. There's 120 or so people in this room. At 100 bucks an hour, that's a $12,000 bill. Verbal ticks. How many people um and ah? Yeah, we all do. Uh, do you know why you do it? This is really interesting. You're gap filling while you think. And it's basically that you've lost control of your ability to speak or not. You're just going, uh. It is the death rattle of speaker. Instead of umming or awing, I mean, you're, you're allowed to speak. You're allowed to pause. You're allowed to be silent, especially in small groups. Why? Because some people talk a mile a freaking minute, leave no pauses, and there's no way for anyone to interject without appearing to be rude because you have to talk over that person. Everyone has a coworker who won't shut the hell up. Yeah. When you take questions from the audience, repeat the question, even if it's just three or four people, this is literally grade two. Use the question in your answer. How many people were in the room? The room was filled with a certain number of people. Ooh. Anybody not past grade two in the room? Yeah, a couple hands, good. Handling feedback. How many people have been gracious when you're told you're an idiot? I'm told I'm an idiot somewhat regularly, so I'm fairly gracious about it. I just go home and, and cry, write poetry, <clears throat> post on live journal. Post-talk follow-ups are really important. If somebody comes to you after a talk and says, can I have your card, I've got a question, or here's my card, can you follow up with me? Do it. Even if it takes you a week, do it. Why? Because you could be in a position where that's your next job, or that's your next client. That's the next important thing. So these are all good ways to be a better presenter. And again, presentations come in big and small. There are ways to have better presentations, too. How many people have attended a really bad presentation? How many people are in a really bad presentation? <laughs> Honesty counts. The presentation gurus will tell you a bunch of things like holding a volleyball and never pointing because finger guns are bad. They'll tell you other things about presenting and how you're supposed to present your story. And you turn into Tony Robbins and you've got big teeth and you're like, you know, guys, we've really got to get together on this sea surf thing that I don't truly understand, but I'm going to tell you about it because I made a Metasploit. Ha ha. Not useful in any measurable way. Because what we're really doing is telling a story. Humans are good at exactly and only two things. Being incredibly lazy. I mean, we are, as a species, professionally lazy. And I have the simplest example for you. This is how you know that you're lazy. Flush toilets. Because it's easier to develop the technology of plumbing and sewage treatment than it is to shovel shit all day every day. We're lazy. We're also incredibly good storytellers. Some of us are authors. Not everyone is. But everyone can retell a story. If you're gifted as an author, off, please. N or Z, it's up to you. But you're all storytellers. You can repeat a story. You know how to take a short joke and stretch it out by adding detail. You know how to take a long story and condense it to the points that matter. You are already good at this. Just do it. A presentation is nothing more than a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's not actually all that hard, but we make it complicated. So I tried to simplify it. 
I, I've done this a few times, I think, uh, and I've got some good ideas here and there. And one of them is communication for hackers. Uh, give me two seconds. Oh, here's a funny note. Uh, on the look the part, it says use antiperspirant in my speaker notes. Turns out that's important. So, communication for hackers. You can go and grab this. It's a just a series of checklists that forces you through a process. And we're all good at following the rules, right? No. Uh, the rules are meant to be broken, but at least once or twice, you should try following the process from start to finish. I think you'll have a better result than you imagine. And when you do it and you have feedback, send it to me so that it can be better. I'll give you cred and everything. What is it? Well, let's start with the simple. We're going to plan. For most people, giving a presentation, especially a large audience presentation, starts with double-clicking on PowerPoint. And you're doing it wrong because you still don't know what you're going to talk about yet. And most of the time, your presentation doesn't start with a title, but that's the first slide that pops up. Let's try it again. Let's do some brainstorming, idea gathering, feasibility. How many people have submitted a uh, CFP response that was a perspective? I'll do this research if I'm accepted. Yeah, do you know why Black Hat delayed sending out their speaker notices by a month this year? So we didn't get any of those. Cool stuff, right? Uh, collecting and collating your ideas. And this can go on for quite some time. I, I have multiple projects that are in flight. Research is partly done, and just over the course of time, I collect little more bits, and I shovel them into Evernote, and later on I can find them. Do that. The plan is important. Nod and smile. The plan is important. Why? Because the A-team says, I love it when plan comes together. Your next step is outlining. And if this is starting to sound like, you know, grade five civ civics class, the first speech you did on three by five index cards that you mumble read to yourself up at the blackboard, it is. This is all remedial, and I'm sorry, but nobody's doing it. So the remedial has to happen. Outlining is very simple. You have to thread a story. What's your introduction? What's your middle? What's your end? What's your understanding that if you're standing on stage, this is where things start, this is the middle, and this is where things end, because everybody in the audience is reading from this side to that side. Little goofy stuff like that. What are you telling me? Tell me, tell me what you told me. All of these phrases that you've heard over and over again. Your presentation, whether it's five minutes or five hours, is still just like doing those essays in high school. It's the same stuff. Put the outline together. Here's the beginning, here's the middle, here's the end. That's what you submit as a CFP. That's what you double check with your boss to make sure that you're on track. That shows that you've got something to talk about. The writing, oh my goodness. How many people write their entire talks? How many people write out their entire talk and then read it on stage from paper? Watch the archives, you'll find more than one has done this. You've got a bunch of ideas, you've got an outline that works. You need to start jamming in actual content. You'll need to do this the first couple of times. You will argue with me that it is the stupidest thing you've ever done. But, again, something that almost all humans have in a together kind of way is if you tokenize something, it crystallizes it. So when I write it down, it solidifies that thought. The thought becomes less rubbery. The thought becomes easier to memorize. You all did this when you're in school. You, know, you write down the notes, and then you rewrite them, you condense them, and it sticks in your head better. That's all we're asking you to do. It doesn't have to be perfect. Grammar and spelling sometimes only count. It gives you a great way to pivot something that might have been a good talk but was never accepted into a blog post that gets published, that gets indexed, that people can search and rely on. Easy peasy. Revising. So here's a good story. I went to film school a long time ago when we actually used film. There were no computers. Not really. And my film teacher in, in the early 90s was a Russian guy. 
big Russian bear of a man, scary as shit. And I'm a Cold War kid. We grew up hiding under our desks because that was going to save us from a nuclear blast. Big Russian in the room. You're right near the beginning of the year. From the back of the class, he yells, FAKUS! You're sitting there, you know, 18 years old. You've just shat yourself. Why is the Russian man yelling at my film? Fakus! Fakus Corner! Jesus, what are you talking about, dude? Well, we finally puzzled it out. Fakus is focus. Uh-huh. And what he was saying was, in your frame, you've looked at the middle, but you've ignored the edges. And you've got messy junk in the edges. You've ever taken a picture of somebody, and they've got a light post behind them? Lamp post? and the lamppost grows out of the back of their head. Totally awesome, except wrong. So we sort of puzzle along. OK, we're getting used to the Russian guy. A couple weeks later, we're, we're screening again. And uh, 60 millimeter film, it, at that point, cost about a uh, buck a foot. Pretty expensive stuff. Uh, and a foot is <laughs> something slightly more than one second. Uh, so we were all poor at this point. We, we just spent 400 500 $700 on our first film crazy Russian from the back, halfway through your film. Kill your baby. <laughs> okay, Vlad, what, what do you mean? Kill your baby now. Okay. Just going to take a step back from you. And what he was saying was, you've got this one shot you've buried in the middle of your film. You're in love with it because it's perfect. It is technically ideal. Exposure is awesome. There's no weird dreeblies around the edges. You're good to go, except it has nothing to do with the film anymore. How many people have a marketing department that refuses to kill its babies? That one PowerPoint slide that does not belong in the deck anymore. It has 37 animations in it. It costs them more than a few thousand dollars to create, and it's awful. End to end, awful. You've got these in your own presentation. A thing in the middle that's pretty, truly pretty and does not belong, get rid of it. Annotating. This is that moment in life where you need to hold up a sign that says citation needed. Because as an industry, we're terrible at this. We all have that idea first. Whatever it was, we have it first. This summer, there was somebody who had a talk all about uh, DMA attacks through Thunderbolt. It was a brand new idea. Nobody had ever thought of it before except for two years ago when Dave Maynard did it during the fail panel. Was credit given? No. Were they the first ones to think this up? Yes, they were, except they weren't. Research is important. Annotation is important. We steal from each other. I stand on the shoulders of giants. Many of my talks, you can look at them and say, you know what, that looks an awful lot like a Johnny Long talk. They're right, because Johnny Long influenced a couple of my early talks. That's not bad. I see people who deliver talks that look a lot like mine. But that's kind of freaking cool. It'd be nice if they said thanks, but you know what? I'm good. This is important stuff. Uh, especially if you're going to use things like uh, Creative Commons images. Putting that little, here's where I got it from, really important. Practice makes you better. We all have movie studios now. For most of us, our movie studio looks like this. Or not this because you don't like this and instead it's got O's in the middle. You've got a webcam. Uh, you theoretically have friends. You at least have work-related acquaintances. If you are doing a talk that is super important to you, to your career, and you need somebody to run it by, I'll take an hour with you. Google Hangouts, Skype session, FaceTime, whatever. We'll go through your talk. It's important to practice. It's important to practice in front of other people who are going to be truthful but not mean in telling you, stand up, stop touching your face and or junk. Your idea in the middle sucks, kill your baby. These are important things that we can do for each other. We're all awesome critics, right? We can find fault with anything. We're an infosec. Our entire job is to point at things and go, ha ha, you suck. You can do this for your friends. Small audience focus. Small audiences are interesting. You know why they're interesting? Because they happen all the time. 
each of you presents at least once a day, every day. And you never see it as a presentation. You call it a conversation or a meeting. But if you treat it like a presentation, you can get better results. The elevator pitch. You have an awesome idea. You have two minutes with somebody really influential. You need a beginning, a middle, and an end. You need the high points you need to hit. You need to be able to stretch or shorten it. If they like your idea, they may step off the elevator and stand in the lobby with you for 10 minutes. Can you redo your talk after those few minutes? Sure. You did the two-minute version, now you can do the 10-minute version. Same talk. This talk stretches from 30 minutes to 8 hours, depending on how much detail I throw into it. Easy enough. How many people have to deliver metrics or statistical information to a group? <laughs> Sorry, you were saying? This is real. This is a big part of our jobs, taking something that is incredibly boring and distilling it down to what's important. This is when a little showmanship helps. Put your shoulders back, take a deep breath, point out the things that actually matter. This line is really interesting because it's not a curve, and it should be. Last year, we had 43 million pieces of spam rejected by our firewall because our CISO doesn't understand the security metrics and smacked them in the face. But you can deliver that information if you treat it as a story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has a climax. Something really important happens. Set it up like that. Don't just go from the beginning to the end of the, of the deck of information. Tell the story of the information. The ask. Love this one. I need you to spend money. Pretty, pretty please. That only works when... No, that never works. Pulling that ask apart into the story. Here's the why. Don't just tell me the need. Tell me what you've done already to attempt to solve it without an ask. Then push it forward. Here's the why. Here's the outcomes. Here's how the story turns into a good story. It is not the second act of a Shakespearean play where all is lost. Sometimes the ask is going to get a reject. What have you done to prepare for that rejection? Include that in the story. We, we need this. If we don't, here's what the, what the backup plan looks like. Monday morning status meetings. Who has them? Monday morning status meetings that they actually pay attention to. Yeah, me neither. Status reports are hard. The biggest reason they're hard is because Outlook schedules things in one-hour blocks automatically. Well, you've got an hour. You might as well fill it, right? Do you know that you can alter that setting? If you happen to be an exchange administrator or no one, alter that setting. 18 minutes. Really freaks people out. <laughs> it ensures that they exit their previous meeting before their next meeting starts. At 12 minutes to get to their next meeting. It ensures that everyone will suddenly pay attention to, wait, I've only got 18 minutes? I can stick to the important parts. Be the person in the status meeting who delivers concisely all of the information necessary in the minimum amount of time. Be prepared for questions. But be the one who shows everybody else how it should be done. If you happen to lead a status meeting, I encourage you to empty the chairs from the room. Status meetings are much shorter when everybody's standing. You would not stand for 50 minutes of this talk. I would have to do it in 20. But because you're sitting, I can abuse your time. You have to deliver bad news. Uh, good idea to preload the sad trombone on your smartphone. Not a good idea to preload the sad trombone on your smartphone. It, everybody has to deliver bad news. Uh, if you have yet to fire someone, I encourage you to give it a try. Uh, you'll understand what personal heartache looks like. Um, especially if it's a you're letting them go not because you want to. Uh, there's always bad stories to be told. And we've got this funny sort of societal thing. We say, you don't, you don't kill the messenger. Well, yeah, sometimes you do. And you don't want to be that messenger. 
you want to be the one who, um, it's one of those funny things. You know, when you're delivering bad news, you can make it sound better. There's a big difference between, you know what, guys? We're screwed. And, hey, we're screwed. You can deliver the bad news in a way that emphasizes the positives, decreases the negatives wherever we can, but tells the story. Anybody getting that common thread, telling a story? Okay. When you do formal presentations, like this one, we have to change the rules a little bit. Almost on time, too. When you go from small to large, the medium changes, and therefore the message changes. The medium of this talk, given one-on-one, -on -one, suggests that it's interactive training, that you're supposed to respond. In this environment, you're just there to be told. I, I would encourage you to tell me when I'm wrong. Laugh, clap, make the guys in the other audience feel like they're missing out. Whatever you think is right. But that medium change becomes important. I need to be more careful in delivering the information to you because you are granting me an audience. I am the supplicant. See how that really screws with the whole InfoSec Rockstar thing? You're not here to see me. I'm here to tell you my idea and hope that you take it on board. Ooh. I just twisted a bunch of people. There's a few of you who are like, oh. See how that changes the respect? How that changes the balance of power? Six minutes into this talk, when I was talking about philosophy, two guys got up and left. They couldn't wait for the really cool stuff at the end. Sorry. I, I screwed up. I didn't give you fun stuff off the beginning. Maybe you're Metasploit developers. We have to modify a few things that are in the tool. The first thing we need to do is kind of smush point number six. We have more important things to do. Before any film gets made, before any story is told using a medium, the story is written out. This usually takes up entire walls in film studios where they draw laboriously each frame. They include which text is underneath it, which director's notes are underneath it. You need to do this. Do it once or twice and you'll understand why. We're humans. We work better with information when it's tokenized. That's why we write. That's why we use money. Tokenization of an idea crystallizes the idea. Your slide deck should be in paper first. Three by five index cards, a blizzard of them. You can move things around more easily. You can change things. You can edit. You can get that satisfaction of the little pile that you've torn in half because the ideas weren't good enough. To know that you've redacted, you've revised, you've killed your babies where you've had to. And you can see it in front of you. 100 slides in PowerPoint doesn't look any different than 10 slides in PowerPoint. But 100 index cards spread out on your desk or your bed or stuck to your wall or your phone is ringing. Then you can develop slides. Because only then have you solidified what you want to say. Your message is complete before the medium has arrived. Kind of cool, isn't it? You need to record it and review it. Record yourself and watch yourself. Uh, I do this weird kind of almost Catholic self-flagellation thing. After every talk I deliver, I watch the video. And I sob at the number of things that I screwed up. But I remember them for next time. You can do this all alone. Flagellate yourself in private. Visual aids are interesting. Here's a guy who, whether you like him or not, whether you like his company or his products or not, you need to respect the fact that he can present shit. Like, holy crap. And he rarely uses visual aids. But when he does, they're very powerful. That same introduction... I'm up all the way. Sound guy? You know, Steve and I... We're going to go back. There we go. Congratulations, my friend. Thank you. Welcome, that is super. Steve. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Steve and I first met uh, about two years ago in New York City 
when he shared with me this vision that he had for this product. And we've been working on it for some time and actually entered into a contractual agreement without us ever seeing the device or the phone. And that was because of the confidence that I have in Steve and his leadership team to deliver on the vision that they have. And every time I see this, it's just wow. It's just wow. It's really, really cool. You've exceeded my expectations. <laughs> it's a real honor for Singular to be partnering with Apple today. And I brought with me another company to celebrate in this. And it's a pretty big company. It's the new AT&T. You know, 11 days ago, AT&T became a full part, I mean, Singular became a full part of the new AT&T family. And this new family will help fulfill the vision we have of wireline, wireless, broadband, and video coming together on one device in the ways that customers haven't imagined. Today, you go from Steve to Stan. What does Stan do? What a condescending piece of shit. Sorry, Stan. You make a shit ton more money than I do every year, but you're still a condescending piece of shit. Condescending to a guy who, when you piss him off, takes over your company. Next to Apple, Pixar to Disney. Did you really want to do that? Really? He forgets the name of his own company at one point. Singular AT&T, he's not sure which. He literally read his index cards. Talk about seeing one side and then the other. He ping-ponged back and forth on the stage, showed you all the ways that he was better than you and more important than you. Remember what I told you about you guys showing up here for me? PowerPoint is not doc. Seriously. If you want to write a Word document, write a Word document. Do not put it in slides, just don't. If you're bad at whiteboard, learn how to whiteboard. Go to Home Depot, buy a piece of shower board, screw it up on the wall in your house somewhere, get some markers, learn to whiteboard. Promise me you'll do it? Yeah, you're lying. <laughs> there are always options. You've got some serious technical fail prevention moments. And because oh I'm my god. Over, you don't get to see the whole thing. But this actually happened. My laptop crashed. It took seven minutes for me to get it back up. I kept talking through the whole thing. I delivered the talk while I was rebooting my laptop that crashed, that decided it was time to launch iTunes, that the file was not in the location I left it last. I had to recover. This happens. Be prepared for it. If you can't deliver your talk without slides, you don't have a talk together. Oh my god. It's a good thing. I'll post a video. You can watch it later. Presentation mode. Everybody uses it, right? One screen has your slides. The other screen has your slides and your notes. Nod and smile if you say, yes, I use presentation mode. Yes. Does anybody not know what presentation mode is? Yeah, look to the person beside you and they'll help you out. It's all good. The look. I actually did this talk. Not only does the title make me laugh my ass off, but I used that template. Because <laughs> it's fun. You know, to use a default template. Sometimes you're handed templates that just make it worse. And so you try and make it better. Full time, push the envelope, next gen, super duper visionary, strategian. Yeah. But you get stuck, and you have to work around it. Sometimes your staff delivers you slides that look like this. And I really wish I was joking. This is a document, not a slide deck. <laughs> In review last couple minutes. It's all about you. Look the part. Antiperspirant is your friend. Stand up straight. Inhale. Your body language counts. I'm angry at you. Or I'm Superman. I'm not sure which. 
hands and arms count, holding volleyballs and pointing with your thumb just makes you look like a douche who holds volleyballs and points with their thumb. Your expression counts. Put a smile on your freaking face. You can hear it on the phone. You can definitely see it when the person's standing in front of you. Your voice matters. You have verbal tics. Accept that. Inhale instead. This is one of those times when inhaling is okay. Sort of. Questions and answers, do it right. Handle feedback. Do your follow-ups. Go and download the tool and have a look. Play with it. I think you'll like it. It works. Uh, those times in life when you see your vanity search pop up and it's your name and the word attrition and you crap your pants and then you read the posting that says, Jericho says you need to see this talk. Small audience focus. We talked about all this stuff as I run up against my time. Elevator pitch. Refine that message for tight and quick delivery. You can deliver boring information if you do it right. Tell a story. Make it interesting. You can make any story interesting enough. Get to yes. End meetings faster. Please, God. End meetings faster. Just do it. Be the messenger who doesn't die. Go from small audiences to large. It is possible. You need to make some modifications. Pay attention to your technical presentation aids. They will work against you most of the time. If you have questions, here's where you find me. Thank you very much for your time. I'll be out in the hallway for about 15 minutes, and then I have to go to Family Day at Purdue, because my second oldest is there. Thanks.